Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Excellent. Well, we're going to worship this morning. If you're somebody new, my name is Chris. If you're somebody old, my name's still Chris, I guess. But we're glad that you're here this morning. And uh, we at The Journey are all about loving God and loving people. And uh, one of the ways that we can share our love for God is through, through song. And it is one of the ways. So we're going to have the words up on the screen. And uh, I would encourage you to sing along. And uh, let's, let's just worship this morning. Surrender to the King. Yeah. Amen. I hope you guys don't mind, but in church I wanted to I wanted to read from the Bible. From Ephesians. 
And this is kind of a hard verse, it seems like, nowadays to think about because uh, everything that's kind of going on in the world around us. If I can figure out my capo, that'd be great too. In Ephesians, it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling in which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, enduring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And this next song is focused on that idea of, of us together in love. Even though we might not agree with each other politically on our favorite football team or baseball team, but that we are one together.
Devin, come on. You were gone for a week, and now you're... I know. I was trying to do the computer thing, too. Give me a break. I got two hats on. To... Well, that ain't that many. Well, you don't have any hats on. <laughs> Good morning. Hey, uh, my name is Devin. I get to be the pastor here, which is pretty cool. Thanks for that. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm glad to, glad that you guys are here. It's, it's awesome that, uh, that we get to worship together. So I uh, just wanted to welcome you to the journey. Um, uh, let you know that we are about uh, loving God and loving people. It's who we are. That's, that's, that's what we're made for. We believe that. It, it all breaks down to that. Uh, we're excited today because we have a missionary speaker. He is currently speaking at another church and will be here any minute, uh, uh, hopefully before we get done. Otherwise, I'm going to have an impromptu sermon, which will be really interesting. Um, <laughs> We, uh, uh, do we have any kids for, for uh, Kids Church today? Yes, we sure do. All right. So they get to go. Um, yep. Tasha is kids back in that Tasha. kids train oh, up. Yeah, she's, <laughs> whoop, whoop. she's ready to leave yeah. the station. Nice. So, all right. You guys have fun with that. Uh, while they're doing that, if you, uh, if you want to take a look at your bulletin that you were given when you came in, or if you didn't, there's more on the table back there. There's a connection card in that. We'd love for you to tear that out and fill that out and, and just give us a little information about yourself and just anything that you want to share with us, uh, please put that on that little form and then drop it in the giving basket that's uh, on the table in the back as well. Uh, with that, if I could just say a word of prayer and we will get back to worship. God, thanks for today. We love you and we're glad that you're here more than anything else. Jesus, we invite you into this place and, and into our lives. And God, we pray that you would fill us. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Savior, 
You guys stand for this next one. that just needs to hear about Jesus. It might be the person that you check out with at the restaurant or at the store. It might be a sibling or a loved one. It might be somebody across the country or across the world. How can they call on who they don't believe? Who can believe if they have never seen? in me. How beautiful are the feet that carry the cross for all to see. I will go wherever you send me. How can they love him who they won't receive? How can they trust in the one who I will go wherever you send me. I'll be 
pitiful are the feet that carry the cross for all to see. I will go wherever you send me. of Ecclesiastes, it, uh, it talks about seasons, and some of you might recognize this because it sounds like a song that was popular, I think, in the 60s. It was before I was alive. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to gain and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. And it goes on and says, What profit has the worker from which he labors? I have seen the God-given task which the sons of men are to be occupied. He has made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice and to do good in their lives. And also that every man should eat, drink, and enjoy the good of all his labor. That is the gift of God. This next song, the chorus, is simply a refrain of saying thank you. And I don't know what you're going through or what you've come through. I think all of us have an opportunity and a need to say thank you. Every day I need you, Lord. Just got to get the right words. Doing what I've always read. Got to find my daily bread. Candlelight on the darkest night. Spending time. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
take a seat. And God, we just, we are so thankful for everything that you've given us. God, the opportunities that we have, the strengths we have, and even the weaknesses that, that we can, we can gather with others and they can lift us up in those areas and we can lift them up in theirs. Father, we are thankful for the gift that you gave of your son on the cross to make us whole, that we no longer would live in fear Lord, with so much going on in the world today, we are thankful for what you've given us and thankful for what you've done for us. Father, I want to lift up anybody in here that's struggling, that's hurting, that's lost hope, anybody online. Lord, and we, we are so thankful that, that you've connected us today. We might not know what they're going through, the hurts, the pains, the struggles, the anxiety, but we just ask that you would heal them, that you would bring them into your arms and that you would hold them and carry them. And God, as we hear your message today, we would ask that we would have open hearts and open minds, that we would be able to carry your love and your grace to the community around us. Lord, that it's your feet, your beautiful feet, that carry us. Help us to do that a little bit. Lord, all of these things we lift up and we praise your name and thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, I just want to share with you a little bit about uh, where we're from as a, as a church, and that'll give some context for when Brad shares with you a little bit about his mission. We, we are part of the Christian and Missionary Alliance. That's a long name, but it's a, it's a denomination. It's a group of people who have come together under the same premise that we have the same ideas about what, what the Bible means when it says loving God and loving people and how important that is. So when we, uh, when we first started the Journey Church, we, um, it, w it was an interesting deal. I was doing youth ministry uh, at a church here in Aberdeen, and uh, uh, we, were, we were working with a youth group, and we were doing our thing, and we had grown the youth group, and, and there were some people at the youth group who were, uh, what is society called, marginal, is that the word? 
uh, they, they, they were getting in some trouble. And there were some of the people at the church that were questioning, what are you doing working with these people who are getting in trouble? And, I, and I, my heart was, that's who we're supposed to be working with, the people who are getting in trouble. And so we continued to do our mission, and, and as we progressed, we eventually decided that we would plant a church. Um, and so a team from that church said, this is, this is our heart, this is our calling, this is what God has called us to do, and so we would start this church. And so the Journey Church began from a youth ministry, and the leaders and the youth in that church and, and sent a, a group of people, a small group of people, to start a church. And I think back about... Um, A.B. Simpson, the founder of the Christian and Missionary Alliance, and I was thinking about how, how he had done what he'd done. He was working in New York, and he was pastoring a very prominent Presbyterian church, and he was doing his thing. And it was interesting back in that day because they would have uh, all of these pews, and people would purchase their pew. That was a thing to do back then. It would show who you are as far as your, your prominence in the church, your power, your prestige. You would purchase a pew, and they would purchase the front row was the most expensive, and they would pay for that, and they would come and sit there, which I think is odd now because that seems to be the one row that's kind of left empty in churches today. But they would purchase the, the front row, and they would, they would do several several rows back, and then you know, way in the back, maybe the, the, you know, the outsiders could sit, maybe. And at that time, there was a bunch of dock workers, immigrant dock workers who would come in and they would um, fill in and they, they couldn't tell or they didn't know that this church was reserved for, or this pew was reserved for this family. So they were sitting wherever they wanted to sit. And they would sit in all of these other people's pews. And eventually the people were like, pastor, you got to get rid of these guys you got all these new, strange people coming into the church, and, and this isn't working. They're sitting in our pews. And so um, he said, really? This is, this is what you want to do? This is, this is what this church is, is about? After all we've been talking about, you're about kicking these people out of church? And A.B. Simpson had had enough, and so he began a new church. And it became, not intentionally, but it became a, a denomination. And in our denomination, we hold that, that idea of bringing others to Christ so highly that uh, being missionary is part of who we are as a church. We are the Christian and Missionary Alliance. And so as a church, we think that's a, a pretty big deal. And we don't talk a lot about our name because that's not really important. We talk about his name because that's the most important Christ is the reason for doing what we do. That being said, my friend Brad has arrived, and Brad will, will share a little bit about his story and what he's been doing. We're, we're, we know that you've come straight from another church, and, and I wish I could give you a breath, but I appreciate you so much. Good to meet you, brother. Good to meet you. Yeah. All right, so uh, Brad is going to share with us uh, a little about... Um, his time, yes. as well as, mm -hmm. as what God has placed on his heart today. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you Thanks. so much. It, uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, it feels uh, it's a little strange to, uh, to have missed uh, what's been going on in the room uh, up to this point, uh, but it's great to be with you this morning and, and uh, had some time with a few, uh, a few folks. Um, when were you together? Thursday night for the pizza thing? Yeah, that was great fun, and uh, the pizza was great, and the uh, fellowship was really great as well. We have been, my wife and I have been working in Iraq, northern Iraq, for the last six years, and um, a place that we never, we never would have imagined that we would have en ended up, uh, uh, but God has uh, his m amazing, mysterious ways of doing all this, right? It's amazing and, and awesome how all of this happens, and... Uh, and to have discovered um, maybe, uh, let's see, we were there six years, uh, maybe six and a half, seven years ago, discovered that the, the uh, number one, that there are international churches in almost every major city of the world. There's, you can find international churches of some sort, even, even cities here in the U.S. Um, and that 
there would be an international church in a country like Iraq. Because we, when we think of Iraq, we, th- we don't think of church, I don't think. Uh, we don't necessarily think of Christians. Uh, we don't think of uh, Martians. Uh, <laughs> sorry, that was just off the top of my head there uh, with that sound. Uh, but uh, what, what has happened is... Uh, um, uh, and let me, hey, let me ask one quick question. Um, I'm assuming that we're streaming live. Is that right? Okay. So I just want to be, I just want to be careful in, in uh, some, some of the things that I, some of the things that I share and so on in, in that case. But um, that's fine. Um, the Christian Missionary Alliance has had people, uh, a team of people in uh, our city for about 12 years, actually, uh, because they, they an, an opportunity opened up uh, because of the kind of the the independence of not the complete independence of the Kurds, but but the independence of the Kurdish people to the extent that the Iraqis, the Iraqi government has given the Kurds a, a level of self autonomy in the northern part of this part of the country. All right, so um, there are actually Kurdish people in in Iran and Turkey and Syria and Iraq, but Iraq has has been where they kind of have had this level of autonomy and this. Kind of, they're running their own show there, kind of, you know, under the umbrella of the Iraqi government. So uh, they're trying hard to be, to be open and to be uh, 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 considered um, uh, open to religion and open to lots of things. And so here, here in the city of Sulaymania, uh, four or five universities. It's kind of a university town. It's kind of known as the, the arts and cultural capital of, uh, of Kurdistan. And so, yeah, we're there. We've been there working with the uh, Kurds. And really, kind of the, the, the vision of this team of people that has been there uh, has been to establish and to grow the church in northern Iraq. And so I, I love our church, but, but we... Honestly, we pray for the church of Sulaymania, like I would pray for, and I've begun already to pray for the church of Aberdeen, uh, the church of wherever I've, you know, as I'm going. And, and so, uh, so it's great to be here and to be with you folks and to uh, make some new connections and so on. We uh, left uh, Kurdistan August 2nd. And we had plans to leave a lot earlier than that, but because of COVID things, airports were actually shut down for an extended time. Uh, um, the whole country, uh, and some, actually much of the Middle East was shut down and, and still is in some ways. So by August 1st, uh, airports in, in Kurdistan had opened and we had made arrangements for a flight on August 2nd. So we flew out and so on. It was tough. It's tough to leave though. And after six years, and uh, honestly, we're, we're transitioning out of that work, and we're uh, going to be living near San Antonio, Texas now. And so uh, uh, Laura's parents are living there, and we said several years ago, when the time comes for you, you guys to need some extra care, uh, you don't have money set aside for you know, assisted living and so on, we will come and, and assist you with that and, and help you in uh, you know, the, the years that God gives you on this earth and so on. So... That's kind of the direction that we're headed now. So it, it, when we were leaving uh, August 2nd, it was really tough to leave because it, in some ways it felt like the, the task is not yet finished. You know, the church hasn't been established uh, fully. There are, some, there are maybe six small groups meeting in our city now, and, and several of them have um, Kurdish pastors that are leading them. Uh, not... not super well-trained pastors, but these are guys who have a heart to, to just love people and, and serve people, and so God's using them. But there are a total of about uh, uh, six groups uh, that are meeting around the city, uh, Kurdish language groups. And so God is in the process of doing this, but the Kurdish church is not standing on its own and, and um, uh, kind of self-perpetuating and, and growing and multiplying like we, we keep praying for. So we're just praying every day for that. But so that, that part of the task is not done, uh, but we also sense that, yes, our time there and our investment there uh, is, is changing and, and coming to an end in, in a sense and so on. Um, let me ask you a question. Um, how many of you have a, have a room uh, in your house or, or your garage that's not finished? You have something that's not finished yet. 
unfinished. All right. Uh, this is uh, typical for most groups that I've been, that I've been meeting with. Uh, almost everybody has uh, a garage or a room, or maybe if it's a whole house that's unfinished, and sometimes these projects kind of seem to go on and on, you know. Um, uh, a couple of our friends there in this city, they run, a, they run an English center, and they, uh, uh, so during this time of COVID, um, they thought, well, maybe this is a good time for us to do this remodeling project that we've been thinking about. So it's, they said, you know, if we can find a, a contractor who is free during this time, we're going to do this remodeling project. So uh, they've, owned, they've owned this building for a number of years, but it, it's in need of some updates, and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I said, careful, remember where you live, and, uh, you know, remodeling projects can kind of go on. Well, you know, the contractor that they talked to, he said, uh, yes, we'll be in and out of there in about three weeks. And I said, right. <laughs> so um, 12 weeks later, they were just wrapping up. And um, I think as we gather here today, the, the project is finished now. Uh, but it was one of those unfinished things for for. Uh, well, it just seems like it could go on and on. Just three days ago, uh, uh, Laura, uh, my wife Laura, who's down in Texas with her family right now, uh, her parents have a little double-wide trailer, and we're going to be moving in with them. And uh, so it's a little bit tight. A little, the space is a little bit tight. But they're, just three days ago, they started a remodeling project. Oh, glory. And so uh, they're adding a room, just adding a room onto the house. And the, and the guy doing the project, he said, two weeks, you know, we'll, we'll wrap it up in about two weeks. And I said, yeah, we'll see. This will go on. This will go on. Um, these same friends who have this, uh, who have this English center, uh, it's, it's considered a non-government organization. And we say NGO, non-government organization. And there's NGOs here, and there's NGOs in all different kinds of countries. Uh, but this, is, this, this English center is an NGO. And so uh, another thing that they're involved in right now is they're, they're trying to renew the license or the, the, uh, the certificate to operate this organization in the country. And uh, because the, the certificate had lapsed a little bit, they kind of had to go back to zero. And so they're in the middle of this unfinished project that they have to go to, to countless offices and get stamps and pay fees and, and talk to this person and that person and shake this hand and that hand. And, and it's, it's going to be one of these things that's going to be un, totally unfinished. But, you know, in the middle of... Whatever you have unfinished or whatever I have unfinished, um, it really kind of pales in comparison to the, to the idea, the process of watching uh, and being a part of Christ being formed uh, in an individual, in a church being birthed, right? But God is, God is in, in, in the midst of all of it and has his hands in all of it. Uh, Jesus uh, said it like this in... Uh, uh, Matthew 24, 14, he said, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached uh, as a testimony to all people, people all over the world as a testimony, as a witness, and then the end will come, he said. Aren't you glad that God knows how to finish? <laughs> so glad God knows how to finish. Jesus himself talks about uh, finishing God's work. Let me see if I can get a, a look at my screen here. Jesus, in John 4, 3, 4 34, he's there at the, at the well, talking with the woman at the well. His disciples show up with food, supplies, supplies from town. And Jesus says this, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. John 17, 4, I have brought you glory on earth. Here's Jesus praying, praying to the Father. I brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. John 19, 30, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. God knows how to finish the work. And yet, I think it's amazing and wonderful and mysterious how God is the master of the already not yet. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, for example, our salvation. Those of us who have placed our trust in Christ, we have been saved. And today we're being saved, and one day we will be saved. The, the, our, our salvation will be complete. And so in a sense, yes, we have the, we have the down payment of that uh, by, by his Holy Spirit. 
And one day, our salvation will be completed by his grace, by his power. Uh, what are some things that you know of right now that are finished? Just shout out something that comes to your mind that's finished right now. Uh, something come to your mind that's finished? Someone said summer is finished. I think that's right. I think summer is over. <laughs> uh, anything else come to your mind that's finished? Uh, Vikings chances. Vikings chances. <laughs> Wow. Uh, I, I think you're right. I, th I think you're right. I, uh, I grew up in Sisseton, actually, and, and uh, my family is kind of in the Dakotas, Minnesota. So I, I've been a Viking. I think you're right. Yeah, yeah I think you're right. Uh, what else is finished? Someone from Finland. Ah, someone from Finland is finished. <laughs> Ooh, and the English teacher trumps your comment. All right, okay. I think at the top of our list uh, would, would need to be the finished work of Jesus for us, how Christ has finished his work, like we read just a few minutes ago, the finished work of Christ on the cross. And in a variety of ways, he talks about that and shows that, that his work for us is finished. And yet, at the same time, Jesus, before he left, you know, after his resurrection, before he went uh, back up to heaven, he uh, gave us uh, his co-mission. He included us, invited us into his mission, right? And we call it the commission, the great commission, in Matthew 28, 18 to 20 as well. Uh, follow along. I'll read those familiar verses, very familiar to most of us. Um, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus knows how to finish, and yet he's including us in the whole process of finishing the task, right? Right? I want to jump off of, uh, of Matthew 24 and Matthew 28 and, and use Paul's uh, first missionary journey that we read about in Acts 13 and 14 and talk about how the task is going to get done. And I think it's pretty simple. Uh, you'll agree that these are pretty simple things. But really, um, it, I would say the, the big idea that I want to keep coming back to and circle around is, is the idea that... that it will take all of us to take all of Jesus to all the world. It will take you to take Jesus to your world. It will take me to take Jesus to my world. It will take all of us to take all of Jesus to all the world. Two ways. First, God invites us into his story. That's simple. And then God invites us into the stories of the unfinished stories of others all around us. Let's go to Acts 13, and I think it'll be on the screen as well, Acts 13, 1 to 3. And here's the setting of what was happening there with Saul. We called Paul later. Saul is there. Now, there were these prophets and teachers in the church in Antioch, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius, the Cyrenian, Manaean, a close friend of Herod, the Tetrarch from childhood, and Saul. While they were serving the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. That phrase, while they were serving the Lord and fasting, I think it makes me realize that God has invited these men already into his story, and they've accepted that invitation, and here's the evidence of it. They are serving the Lord in this church, and they're, they're fasting and serving the church, and so on. But it, but it does prompt me to go back and just review Saul's story, because uh, we know some details about Saul's life and how God used such a bright light, like one of these, uh, to invite Saul into his story. Saul, a, a leading Jewish uh, student, very zealous for the law, imprisoning Christians in Jerusalem, getting permission from the Jewish leaders to go to Damascus to do the same thing. He's on his way with some other men. Boom, bright light from heaven. Jesus shows up and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And so he has this amazing encounter with Jesus. 
And, uh, and God, in that, those hours and days, Saul's there blind for three days and just praying and waiting. Ananias goes, prays for him. He receives his sight. And, and Paul has accepted the invitation into God's. He's going to be a part of God's story now. Instead of against God's story, he's going to be part of God's story and what God is writing inside of him. I look at this setting here in Antioch, and I, I realize with great encouragement that this is the first international church, and, I, and I'm, I'm in good company. Because here, um, look at the characters who are there. Barnabas, Barnabas is a Jew from Cyprus. Simeon, the Niger, or the black, He's very likely from, from somewhere in Africa, maybe North Africa, Simeon the Black. Uh, Lucius is from a coastal city that's just west of Egypt, so again, North Africa. Manaean is connected to the governor's family, and, and Paul, or Saul, back in those days he was called Saul, Saul is a Jew from Tarsus. And so here they are in this international, probably the first international church, and they're serving the Lord and, and fasting together, praying together. How many of you have tried to steer a boat that is not moving? Is it easy, easy to, do the, to do that? It's pretty much impossible to steer a boat that's not moving. But here we see these guys in process. They're, they're moving. They're, they're serving the Lord and fasting. They're, they're on the move in the church of Antioch, and God just says, hey, steer these guys this way and send them out for the thing that I have for them. Let me tell you a little bit about um, my story. Um, I grew up, uh, like I said, I grew up a number of my years in Sisseton. My dad actually was working with Lowell Lundstrom Ministries. As some of you may know that name from years ago now. Uh, this family traveling around and singing country gospel music and preaching and so on. And so my dad uh, had been pastoring a church up in North Dakota, and uh, they asked him to come and work with them. And so he basically, he was their uh, crusade coordinator. So he would go ahead of them and kind of set up the schedule and, and meet with pastors and train counselors. And, and then the Lundstrom family would come to town and, and do their services and so on. And then and then they would have this follow-up time afterwards uh, and so on. So that's kind of what's kind of his job for some of his time with them. So, uh, yeah, my dad was a pastor, and then he was working for this evangelistic team. But really, it wasn't until I was about 10 years old, 10, 11 years old, that, I, that everything kind of came together for me. Because, I, you know, I've been in church since, I'd, since I was born, basically. Uh, but one night, we were actually at a, at a Lundstrom service over in Morris, uh, Minnesota. They were there for a one-night thing, and we were, our family was there. And, and somehow, by God's grace, uh, something Lowell said that night just kind of brought everything together. And I realized that I, I wasn't going to heaven because my parents were, my dad was a pastor, or because they worked with Lundstroms, or anything, anything like that. I, had, I needed to accept God's invitation for myself. Well, I didn't say a prayer that night, but the next, I was just feeling this heaviness, like, oh, wow, I, I know exactly what I need to do. And I, <sighs> the next day, I was talking with one of my sisters, uh, who was just two years younger than me, and, and we realized that we both were feeling the exact same thing. We knew exactly what we needed to do uh, with the conviction that we were feeling inside. And so we actually knelt down together, uh, by my bed, and we prayed and trusted Christ together that day. And um, we were so excited, so excited about our new faith that we took uh, the three, our three younger sisters uh, out to the garage, and we locked the door, and we wouldn't let them leave until they prayed. So, hey, I would, uh, no, I wouldn't recommend that, uh, that technique, but um, it seemed really good at the time for an 11-year-old. Uh, but I began, I began growing in my faith. Uh, we had a chance to be involved in a, a, a very active youth group and some good teaching and so on. Uh, so growing in my faith and my understanding of, of who God is and, and his call to us and so on, I ended up uh, going to what is now Crown College and, uh, and majoring in music for two years and then switched to Bible and theology and was sensing that maybe God wanted me to be a pastor somehow. Okay. Uh, but a lot, not a lot of direction uh, in my life until my, my last year 
uh, we were at a, uh, every Thursday morning we had a, a special missionary chapel, whatever, and, and one morning that fall, uh, God used the speaker that morning to, to really speak directly to me and say, hey, this isn't just one of your hundred options or whatever. This is exactly what I've been preparing you for, for your whole life. And so from, and I said yes that day. I just said yes, yes, I'll do that. And so from that day onward, I was headed towards some sort of uh, service overseas. And we, I didn't know what that would look like. My wife, Laura, was born actually in Hollywood. And uh, her parents, her dad was trying to become a, a singer. <laughs> uh, her grandpa, her dad's dad, had been in the movies, had made a number of movies, nothing super famous. But he had, been, he had done some movies and some TV and some radio back in the 40s. Uh, early 50s, and so their family had some connections kind of into that world, and so uh, that, that's where they were when Laura was born. That didn't work out uh, for them, but, um, uh, but they were part of a Lutheran church back in those days, and um, Laura's mom uh, found Jesus. Uh, it wasn't actually in the church. It was uh, at some sort of something outside the church, but then she brought Laura to a, a special evangelistic kind of a rally, and, and Laura got saved, and very quickly... Kind of within that first year of, of her newfound faith there, God used their pastor, their Lutheran pastor, who had, he had been working um, somewhere, uh, I think somewhere in, in West Africa, one of the countries of West Africa, he had been working. And so God kind of used his story to prompt her saying, hey, I, I want you to be headed this direction, you know. And so her just really feeling like God was leading, pulling her that way. Well, uh, about a year later, God called her parents to be, to be workers, to be missionaries, and they ended up training with uh, Wycliffe Bible translators and then went with Lutheran Bible translators to Sierra Leone, West Africa, and were some of the first people in there with the Lutheran group, and, and her dad was going to be the business manager and so on. Well, they were fairly new in their faith and still just studying the Bible, reading the Bible, and, and soaking it all in, and, and they realized that there were some things uh, some differences that they feel like they had, that felt like they had with the, the Lutheran Church, and so they ended up leaving Sierra Leone, coming back to the U.S. and and he trained to uh, in a small seminary up in um, up in New Hampshire, and then he they took a small church out in Cali back out in California area, and uh, were there a few years, and then in '79 ended up in San Antonio. Uh, where Laura's grandparents, her mom's parents, had retired from the military. So that's where they, they kind of have been since in the San Antonio area. And first were introduced to the Christian Missionary Alliance there and were part of a church there. And then that's what helped kind of bring Laura to Crown. And that's where we met when she came to Crown College. And so God brought us together there. And, and our calls were in very different uh, times and places, but God brought us together and, and kind of set us on a course. Um, yeah. I'm wondering, what, what's your story today? Has God invited you into his story? I'm sure that he has. And perhaps most all of you have said yes. Some people talk about it as, I want to invite God into my story, but I... I prefer kind of talking about it where God invites us into his story because God's the one who's initiated everything, right? He's the one who, who has shown us such amazing love. Well, basically, while we were still enemies of God, he's the one who initiated everything. So that's kind of how I'm talking about it this morning. God inviting us into his story and, and, and the unfinished stuff of what he's writing inside of us. But I realize that maybe it's possible you're here today in the room or you're, or you're watching the stream and you're saying, I... I don't know exactly what you're talking about. Let me just, let me just simply say um, that all of us have sinned. We've all missed that, that mark of perfection of, of God's glory, and none of us is acceptable to God. But God has shown us how much he loves us and how much he wants a relationship with us by sending us Jesus, while we were still sinners, while we were still enemies, Jesus came, lived, died, and rose again, all for us. And today, if we declare with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, that we are saved by faith. 
Once we've been made right with God in this way, through faith in Christ, we are able to experience true and lasting peace and life forever with him. And this is where it all begins. This is where true life begins, uh, everlasting life begins, uh, uh, true identity, uh, true security and significance. And this is exactly why Laura and I have been leading the international church in northern Iraq. This is why we're here today, right? This is exactly why we're here today. Because God is inviting us into his story. And out of this new life in Christ, we keep getting to know him and to love him so that we can love and serve people. I know uh, enough about this church and this group of people to know that this is a group of serving people, loving people. And I say, bravo, praise God, praise God. Keep serving, keep learning uh, who God is and growing in your understanding of, of all that that means because God keeps inviting us deeper and deeper into his story. And he invites us into the unfinished stories of others because, yes, it will take all of us to take all of Jesus to all the world, right? The Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Up to this point, it almost seems like the, the missionary activity of the church had, had almost been happening by accident, not, not really, I mean, because God's orchestrating all of it. But think of, um, for example, think of Philip and the Ethiopian. Philip gets taken out of where he's been in this big revival, and God takes him and sets him on this south road. And here he, he encounters this Ethiopian eunuch on his way back south, and, and he gets up in the chariot with him, and he explains God's word to him. The guy places his trust in Christ. They stop, and he's baptized, and boom, Philip is gone. We see God's hand in, in Peter and Cornelius and that story where an angel appears to Cornelius, God appears to Peter, giving him these visions, and then God brings all of that together. Peter goes to Cornelius' house, speaks the truth, and God's spirit falls on them. But here we see something a little bit different where the Holy Spirit says, as these men are, are serving and fasting, God, the Holy Spirit says, set apart these two men for a task that I have for them. And, and Paul and Barnabas respond. They're the ones who are commissioned to execute this, and they, they lay their hands on them, and they send them out. And, and then the end of Acts 14 is the end of their, their trip. So they go out on this extended trip, right? Uh, verses 21 to 28 talk about the end of the trip. After they had proclaimed the good news in that city, that is the city of Derby, I believe, and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, to Iconium, and to Antioch. They strengthened the souls of the disciples and encouraged them to continue in the faith, saying, we must enter the kingdom of God through many persecutions. When they had appointed elders for them in the various churches with prayer and fasting, they entrusted them to the protection of the Lord in whom they had believed. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. From there they sailed back to Antioch, the, the Antioch where they had first left from, uh, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. Well, there's an interesting thought. So they've, they've completed the work. I'm thinking, though, that their task was unfinished, right? So they completed their trip. They arrived, they gathered the church together, they reported all the things God had done with them, and that he had opened a door of faith for the Gentiles. So they spent considerable time with the disciples. Let me come back just briefly to, uh, to uh, Laura's and my story. So we, uh, I finished Crown in uh, 84. We got married in 1984, and we've been married 36 years, praise God. And... Um, so at that point, we're headed toward some sort of service overseas we're thinking and, and praying and planning for. But we, had, we knew a pastor of, a, of an alliance church in Fort Worth, Texas. And so they said to, he and his wife said to us, hey, why don't you come down to Fort Worth and just live and get jobs and, and pay off your bills and, and work with us? And so we said, yeah, we'd do that. We accepted their invitation to come. We, we uh, got jobs. I worked at Chili's uh, as a cook 
for four years. Oh my word! Uh, and Laura got a couple had a couple different jobs during that time. So we're there waiting, uh, working in the church, serving, and so on, and just seeking for God for what's next. And uh, a whole bunch of things happened along the way, uh, but God began um, leading us to the idea of maybe working with kids overseas somehow. And this was actually a dream that Laura had had for a number of years since her parents had been in West Africa and she and her two younger brothers had gone to a small boarding school. And so Laura kind of had this dream of maybe one day being a, a dorm mom, a boarding home mom. And, and sure enough, uh, God was also kind of leading my heart and kind of opening my heart to that idea. And so we, we finished up the whole application process with the CMA and at the top of the paper, we wrote, hey, if you have any need for, for dorm parents, we'd be willing to do that. Well, they called us in like 10 days. They called us on the phone and said, hey, we need three sets of dorm parents right now. And so basically from that moment on, we were just on this fast track uh, to, uh, uh, to Paris. Uh, by, by September, we were, we were in Paris and studying language, studying French a crash course in French for three months, and then we went off to West Africa to the country of Cote d'Ivoire, and we were part of uh, the staff there at International Christian Academy for about well over 12 years we were there. So it was an amazing place. Uh, it was an amazing fit for us, just loving kids and, of all ages and uh, ministering to, to missionary families from all over West Africa, and that was uh, awesome and amazing. Uh, around 2000, we left there, and uh, we were uh, eventually uh, reassigned to go to Conakry, Guinea, uh, which is just a neighboring country to Cote d'Ivoire. We were just there for about two months. Uh, a, a, a terrible event happened. We were actually robbed in the middle of the night, and it's a long, long story that I, I won't talk about this morning, but uh, a very, very uh, awful thing happened. And, um, and so we, we came back to the U.S., and... Uh, and had some time of uh, some counseling for our whole family and so on. And uh, eventually, then God uh, opened up a door for us to stay in the U.S. for a while and uh, went out to Montana, to Missoula, Montana. And I was a worship pastor out there at a church for about eight years. And then, um, and that was great. God used us there, and it was great. And God began to stir. Those were the days where God was really stirring in my heart. Uh, just the idea of the importance of not just being discipled, but to but but discipling, you know, men discipling men and women discipling women. And, and that's where the, the real deep growth happens in our lives is in this intentional discipling time. So that was kind of growing in my heart. And then uh, an, a door opened up for us to go back to West Africa. So we went to Senegal, uh, to Dakar, Senegal, and actually worked in another school there for about three years. And we were high school uh, boys, dorm parents for two of those years, and then the last year um, I was the chaplain of the school, and we were over all the dormitories and so on. And uh, our son finished uh, school there. He's our youngest. We have two daughters. Uh, they're in Minneapolis right now. And our son finished school there, and then we came back in 2013. He took a gap year. We got jobs for a year, and then he went to Crown College and started work there. Well, during that year, we were kind of wondering, okay, what... Our time, our time kind of with uh, missionary kids is kind of coming to a close is what I was sensing. I mean, and so this is about the time that I began to find out about international churches uh, all, all over the world and that there was an opening in a creative access, like a closed country. There was an international church there. And so piece by piece, uh, we, the doors opened for us to, to go and be a, part of, be a part of that. But when we arrived in the city of Sulaimania, I'll just say Suli for short. Uh, we arrived in Suli. Uh, there, the church was there, and they had just purchased a church building uh, and so on. And part of the church, in part of the church, were a, 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 a brother and two sisters from Iran. Well, about a year and a half before that, they had been in Iran, and the three of them were in, they grew up in a very, very conservative Islamic family, in probably the most conservative city of Iran. Um, so the chances of them coming to faith in Christ were probably zero. But God did something uh, very special for them. 
they actually got a they actually got satellite TV at their house and and they discovered that there were channels, Christian channels, where there was teaching about the Bible in Farsi, in their own language. And so they were they were just eating it up, you know, just loving it. So late at night, they, after their parents were in bed, they would go into the, they would sneak into the TV room and they would watch, watch this and listen to this Christian teaching into the wee hours. And so this is what God used to bring them to faith in Christ. And, and uh, they began to grow in their faith. Well, they're, you know, these are the only three kids of the family and their parents were so angry, so upset that they basically locked them in their home for months and wouldn't let them leave their house. And just, you know, made excuses for the whole family and, and everything. It was just, it was awful. And they realized, they realized that they, for them to have any sort of a life, they were going to have to somehow get away. And so they were praying about how they could get away, how they could escape from their, from their parents, really. And God opened up one day, God opened a door wide open, and the, and the door was left open, the door of the room was left open, and, and they had access to the car keys, uh, their shoes had been taken away from them. And, and this has to do with a cultural thing in Iran and Iraq, where if you come into the, someone's house, you take off your shoes. And then you just wear slippers around the house. Well, they didn't even have access to their shoes. But they went out. Uh, they had this opportunity to get out of the room, out of the house, get to the car. And they opened up the, the trunk of the car, and their shoes, all their shoes were in there. And so they got in the car, and they took off to a neighboring town. They left the car there. They got on a bus, and step by step by step, they got to the border and, and presented themselves at the border as religious refugees, and they were allowed to come into Iraq. And uh, so by the time we arrived there, they had been uh, in our city for about a year or so, and they were part of our church there. Well, they still had a lot of fear because our, our city of Suli is only about an hour, hour and 15 minutes from the Iranian border, and they had extended family members who were high up in the Iranian government. So they still had some fears that, that with Iranian influence in our province, that they could still somehow be snatched away and, and taken back. And so they were very uh, scared to be out and about much at all, um, even, to be at, even to come to church. Uh, and some of that had to do with you know, two beautiful young Persian women uh, and the Kurdish guys uh, not, not being a good mix. But, um, so they, they weren't in the regular habit of coming to church, uh, and so we realized they were, they were just starving to death for fellowship and, and just for spiritual growth and so on. So we, every Wednesday morning, I started going to their apartment, picking them up, bringing them to our house, and, and us spending time together, just discipling together, um, uh, the, Laura doing crafts and arts and stuff with, with the, the two gals because they're amazing artists. And Sam, um, Samuel and I speaking about you know, God's word or my upcoming message or my last message or whatever. Sometimes, sometimes it would just be us having some fun together, you know, playing a game together or watching some old classic movie together. Uh, and they had enough English that they could understand that. But just them, allowing them to take a breath and feel like they can, I can... I can just kind of be myself and be normal here for a few hours. Well, about three years ago, we found out about a program that Canada was doing to bring in Iranian religious refugees. And so we um, helped them walk through the whole process, the whole application process. And it was very long and laborious uh, and so on. But, uh, but eventually, it all lined up, and they, about two, just over two years ago, they flew to Toronto, and they're in Toronto now. Uh, so we, you know, they're, they're kind of like our kids, you know, he's, um, Samuel's in his 30s now, and the, the two sisters are late 20s now, uh, but these kind of became our kids. God allowed us to be part of their unfinished story, uh, and we'd love to have you, have you join us praying for Sam and Jojo and Becca uh, are the names that we call them. Let me tell you one other story, and then we'll come to a close. Uh, about the same time we went to Suli, uh, ISIS had started moving down through the country of Iraq, and they were headed toward Baghdad, and they were just destroying people and villages and, and churches and stuff all along the way. And when they got near Tikrit, the city of Tikrit, 
um, families were, were fleeing from Tikrit as well. And one family uh, came to our city from Tikrit, and the, the dad had some business connections in our city. And uh, one of the kids, his name was Abed, uh, had missed, he had just missed out on taking his final exams in Tikrit when all of this happened. And so he, uh, he got into a temporary school that was set up in our town for all these internally displaced people, all these people who had escaped from other parts of Iraq and come into Kurdistan. And so he became part of one of these schools. Well, basically, he was taking his first senior year. I mean, he was taking his senior year again so he could take his exams and so on. Well, during that year, he and a few of his high school friends found out about a, a United Nations project that was being done with Syrian refugee children where uh, an Irish NGO had come into our city, and there were people there spending time with these kids, playing soccer and teaching English and so on. And so Abed and his, a couple of his buddies volunteered to be part of this project because they love soccer, and, and they had... Actually, Abed learned English playing video games, if you can imagine, uh, hours and hours and hours of video games. Uh, and his English was quite good. Um, so one of these guys from Ireland had not just come for soccer and English. He had come to tell anyone who would listen about Jesus. And it turned out that Abed was the only one who would listen to him. And so they began spending a lot of time together, going out for tea, going out for coffee, uh, and just hanging out, talking. And Abed had lots and lots of questions because, yeah, his, his parents were, they followed Islam, but not super committed to Islam. Uh, and Abed himself uh, had never really believed that Islam was the real thing, you know, was, was true and was real and was what he should follow. And so he had lots of questions. And so this guy finally said, Abed, you, you have so many questions. You should just, you should just get a Bible and, and start reading the Bible because your, your questions would all be answered. And so actually Abed downloaded a Bible onto his phone, his smartphone, and he began reading the Bible every day. Sometimes for hours a day, he would read the Bible. And along the way, he found out, out of all about Jesus and who Jesus is and the whole story. And he began to believe that it was true. Everything was true. And it was for him, for him. He began to place his trust in Christ. Well, understandably, his family did not respond well. His parents were, were very upset, even though they weren't necessarily really committed Muslims, but they were very, very angry that that Abed was making this choice. And so they treated him very, very badly. And I won't go into all those details, but um, eventually uh, it came time for Abed to take his final exams at this temporary school that was set up. And uh, so he went that day, took his tests, came back home to the house, and the house was completely empty. They had just disappeared, and they had left him behind. Um, so he was totally on his own in the city. He had a couple of friends, but it really had no one that he could really turn to. And he tried connecting with uh, a priest. There's a, Catholic, a small Catholic church in town and, and uh, wasn't really, didn't really feel a welcome anywhere. But someone said to him, hey, you know, there's an international church in the city. You should try to find it. And so miraculously, you know, he looked on Google Maps and he thought he found the, the neighborhood where the church was. And so uh, I happened to be outside uh, doing some work, moving some gravel from the front of the building to the back, and I see this young guy just kind of hanging around. It's like he's waiting for someone. And uh, I said, hello. And he said, hello. And uh, so I was kind of surprised by uh, the fact that he didn't seem to have any accent. So we ended up sitting down for about an hour that afternoon and talking, and uh, very carefully, cautiously trying to get to know this young guy, uh, thinking, okay, this is, he probably is with ISIS and he's going to kill me at some point. Uh, but basically from that day onward, uh, for more than a year, he was at our house every day. And for most of that year, he actually lived with us uh, because he just didn't have any other place to go. And so Laura and I became his parents, really, and, and our, the international church became his family. And uh, God continues, he's continuing to write 
Abed's story. Abed is still living in Suli. Uh, just before we left, at the end of July, I was helping him get, kind of get settled in a, uh, a little one-room apartment in, in the house of a Kurdish friend of ours. And um, he's been living on his own for, for some time now, but has struggled to, to have a regular job because one of the things that his parents did was they took his passport and, and his ID papers and birth certificate and everything. So, so it's been a, it's been a, a long, long uh, uphill battle for Abed. So, um, but he's still there. He's, he's a member of our church there and has been baptized and is continuing to be, always be on the lookout for someone to share Jesus with because that's how I discipled him, you know, by God's grace, discipled him to not just be mature in Jesus, but to always be looking for faithful men to entrust the gospel to. And so uh, that's what God's doing in Abed right now. Uh, so we'd love to have you pray for Abed as well. God is continuing to invite us into the unfinished stories of other people, right? Because it will take all of us to take all of Jesus to all the world. And God is good to do that. It could be, my guess is that God has been speaking to your heart about something, not just this morning, but maybe in the days and weeks that came up to this morning, that maybe God's been nudging you about something, some way that he's been inviting you uh, either to, to go deeper with him and in your relationship with him or into someone else's life and to, and to invest in the life of someone else. That God's been extending an invitation to you to do that. Maybe it's here uh, in the city. Maybe it's across the state. It's across the country. Or maybe it's farther. Uh, it could be that God is asking you to do some, more than you've ever done and, and go farther than you've ever gone before. I don't know. But the, the beautiful thing is that, that he goes before us and behind us and above us and below us and alongside of us and in us all along the way. It could be that the simplest and easiest thing for you to do is to, is to uh, give money to support someone else to go. I understand that, that maybe that would be the easiest thing for you to do if you have cash in your pocket or, or uh, God is saying, hey, um, I have you here, but I want you to support this person or, or this project or whatever. That's great. Praise God. Uh, and and I, I think the important thing is for every group of believers to be involved, yes, involved in the neighborhood, involved in the city. And I know you guys are very invested and involved in the city. But also, at the same time, be involved beyond, you know, to be involved in the state or in the country or in another country as well. And just have this sense of the, the hugeness of God. I think that's all part of the whole big package, right, that God is calling us to. So, yeah, maybe, maybe uh, God is saying give. But maybe he's saying uh, pray. Maybe you've got more time than money. <laughs> and so maybe for you, the easiest thing, the best thing would be to say, okay, I, I've got time on my hands. I want to figure out how to be a better, more of a praying person, you know, and to make that part of my life from, from today onward. I remember, one, one more brief story. I uh, remember uh, uh, I took Abed with me almost wherever I went to meet with guys and, and try to, you know, mentor guys and disciple guys. And, and Abed was kind of just along. Uh, observing and being a part of that. And so one night, uh, well, we were in the bazaar. We, we like to go to the bazaar. It's kind of this huge open-air mall is what it is. Just tons of little kiosks, cell phone shops everywhere, uh, used clothing shops everywhere, uh, tailors here and jewelry stores there. It's just this amazing place. I never thought I would uh, ever learn it, but uh, it's a favorite place for us to go and hang out. And so we're there um, in the bazaar, and we meet this guy. We, we stop at a key shop. I wanted to get some keys made, and so there's a key shop there. And this guy starts speaking English to us. His name is Kocher, and his family runs this shop. And, and he has a brother uh, that we met later on, but, but we started calling these guys the Key Brothers because their, their family had this shop. So they make keys and sell locks and door handles and stuff. So Kocher said, hey, I'd love to meet with you guys and practice English and, and find out some more about you. And, um, and we'd even talked about religion. And they, so many Kurds love talking about religion and talking about politics and, 
and the economy. Those are the top three topics. So I said, okay, let's, let's go to a coffee shop. Let's go to a tea shop and meet. So we're, we're, we meet Kocher and his brother this one night, and, and we're sitting in this dingy little coffee shop, and, and there's people everywhere smoking. And, and, uh, but, but we get there, and, and these two guys, they want to they wanna just dive deep into what is Christianity all about, and what about, what about the Bible, and what about Jesus, and so on. And so I'm... I'm just sensing such a freedom just to, just to spew out whatever God is just bringing to my mind. And um, uh, they ask a question, and I, and, you know, I just sense this coming and this coming, and, and just such a freedom in this whole conversation. And at, at one point, I'm thinking to myself, how is this happening? <laughs> how is this happening? I mean, I'm in a little smoky coffee shop in northern Iraq, and I'm having this amazing conversation and then the thought came to me, there are people praying for you right now. They're praying for you right now. And we've known that you know, many people have, have, over the years, committed to pray for us. But in that moment, I just sensed it in such a powerful way that this conversation was happening because people were praying for us. So that's why I, I invite you to pray for Abed and for Sam and Jojo and Becca, uh, our, our kids and uh, uh, I'd love to be in prayer for the Church of Aberdeen in the weeks and months ahead as well, and for what God is doing here, and, and to stay in touch with you folks as well, and just to know what God is doing in this city for the glory of his name. So maybe God's talking about giving or or praying for people, but maybe he's actually been nudging you about going some, actually going somewhere. Maybe it is just going, maybe it's going across the street, <laughs> borrowing a wheelbarrow, or lending something to your neighbor, or whatever it might take to make a connection with somebody and have a conversation. But maybe it is going farther. Maybe it's going to Minneapolis, or going to Portland, or going to Shanghai, or going to even... Iraq. <laughs> we actually, over the last years, have hosted a number of short-term teams and interns, anything from a week to a month to six months to a year to the rest of your life. Uh, uh, amazing opportunities we're having there to, to yeah, teach English, but have conversations and make friendships and hang out and drink a cup of tea and talk about Jesus. Uh, to people who are so hungry, so thirsty for something that's real. So many conversations we've had uh, where people have said, yeah, you know, my family, they follow this, but I really don't believe anything. I really don't believe in anything right now. And, you know, uh, for so many of them who have come to faith now, that's, can, that's kind of been part of their journey. Even for Sam and, and Jojo and Becca, they came to the place of just, they would say, I, I was just an atheist. I didn't believe that there was even a God. Well, then into that sort of a, uh, the soil of their hearts and minds, God brought the truth and, and this poof, and the life of Jesus kind of exploded in them. And that's, that's kind, of what's, kind of what's happening as well. So I don't know what God is, is saying to you specifically, but my, my encouragement as we, as we close this morning is that whatever invitation God is giving to you, whether it's... Uh, uh, God's inviting you into his story and what he wants to write in your life, uh, or whether he's inviting you into the lives of others, the unfinished stories of others, that you will say yes to that, that you will respond with a yes to that, um, and join us, because you'll be very, very glad that you, that you said yes to Jesus, no matter what he's saying to each of us this morning. Let me pray for us. Father, um, Thank you so much for this, this, uh, just this brief time together, um, and I pray for, uh, uh, for long-term connections to come out of this day and uh, out of these days here. Um, I know that there's been reconnections for me, and that's been sweet, but also uh, new connections with people and into the lives of, of your church here, and so I'm so grateful. My, my prayer for all of us is that we... We become people of the yes. <laughs> when, it, when, it, when it has to do with you and responding to you and whatever you're saying to us uh, in this moment, that we say, yes, Lord, 
I will do that. Yes, Lord, I will think that. Yes, Lord, I will say that. I'll go. Thank you, Father, for your amazing love and for your grace and for the power of your spirit that, that leads and guides and, uh, and s- propels us out uh, into the world. And we give you thanks. And to say, glorify your name in these days. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Brad. Uh, just want to encourage you. Um, it does. It takes all of us to take all of Jesus into all the world. That's a fantastic phrase. Um, if, if God has prompted you through this message or past messages or anything that, that you want to take further, even if it's something as simple as God has been prompting me to talk to my neighbor and I just don't know how, come, come and share that with us at, at the very you know least and most at the same time we can be praying for you in that conversation or if it's a, a missions thing we can hook you up with some resources or or we can help with that we are we are again we're very into missions and if God has prompted you I would just encourage you to come and see uh, one of us or, or myself for sure to uh, to talk about that and what the next steps are um, some quick announcements. We have our small groups. We have our prayer group on Tuesday. Uh, would love to have you pray with us or, or come and share your prayers. Uh, um, you can do that online or you can do that in person. We also have our Thursday night group where you can come and um, it's a family group and we're studying uh, First Peter as we talk about walking the talk uh, and growing in our own faith and would love to have you with that. Um, Giving, we have the basket in the back. If uh, if you feel led, if God is is prompting you to give to the ministries here uh, at the at the journey, we would just encourage you. The basket's in the back. Go ahead and put that in there. We don't pass a plate around here. Um, and serving, uh, if you are interested in serving in any way, come and see me. Um, and again, we just encourage you. It, it might be as simple as we share the gospel, as we share who Jesus is. It might be just as simple as, as you inviting somebody to church and growing, growing the church that way for God's glory. That being said, we love you guys. Thanks for being part of the family. Thanks online uh, for, for sticking with us. Uh, we love you too. Uh, have a great, great week. Hey, thanks for sticking with us. Uh, I hope that you have a great week. I pray that we continue to grow closer to God. Hope to see you soon.